ever a time that the tenets of this fraternity have been needed in history, it's got to be today. Because I'm watching this world divide out into camps, camps divided by religion, camps divided by ethnic base. And this is the place, uh, one of the references made here by uh, Brother Fleming, when he said, if you are a Christian Mason, you should come into York Rite. And those of you who are visiting now tonight and wonder about this fraternity, the fact that he said Christian Mason is because there are all kinds of Masons who are other religions. My brother Neil, during World War II in Karachi, what was then part of India, was in a lodge in which the holy book that was on that altar was a Koran. And uh, at this point, I think is when the world probably needs this. You hear references, and I really want to talk uh, tonight to those of you who are not members of this fraternity. You'll hear references to things like a trestle board, and if you don't know what that is, the trestle board is the architect's board in which he lays out the work for the day that the workmen are to carry out. And anybody who's been in the construction business knows what a trestle board is and the modern version of it. Uh, but the idea of having you men in here who are friends and not members of the craft, that's something very new. Because the old system, and by old I mean literally for centuries, right up until the most recent uh, decade, the old century was that you never asked anyone to join. Now can you imagine a fraternity that bases itself but never asks anyone to join? It's only when they ask to join, so they've come of their own free will. And we finally set that aside. But even un so, under that never asking, it rose to over five million Americans who wound up in this fraternity. Also, it was a secret society. It obviously isn't today, but it was, and, uh, and for good, very good reason in ancient times. But it also was of an oral tradition, and was mentioned here that they are plays. And that's right. Understand, most of the, uh, if you just go back a couple of hundred years, most of the Masons in any lodge could not read or write. Illiteracy was standard. Uh, the royalty who ran uh, countries could not generally read or write. It was very unusual. And as such, uh, everything was taught by means of the play or taught orally, and you had to memorize. And that's why you have those traditions that grew up and stayed with this fraternal organization. Now, why was it secret? I mean, my best uh, determination, at least from my background, as a former professor. Far as I can see, the ancient uh, base of the Masonic uh, degree, Master Mason was in a sense an engineering degree. So that you were either an apprentice or a journeyman or a master. And that's still true in the AFL and the trades today. We still use those designations. But you see, you didn't have the ability to chase credential. So when somebody's traveling in a foreign land and they step in and say, I'm a uh, fellow craft, or I'm a master mason. Well, they need to get some proof before you let him take over charge of building either a particular arch over a doorway or a part of a building. And that's why they had these secret do guards and signs and secret words and could sit down with them and decide had they really learned those lessons, were they really given to them? And it, that's the reason it was passed on, and I really think it was a form of credential that allowed people of the trades, particularly when cathedrals were being built all over Europe, it gave them the ability to travel and be able to prove that they were what they said they were. Because if you don't have your credential, you're dead in the water. And uh, even in modern times, that's true if you can't uh, come up with it. But that was the basis of it, and I think that's the reason for all of these old techniques. Now, the question is, why don't we get rid of them? Because I think there is a value in history and historical repetition. There was for me. Uh, Mike mentioned that I was raised uh, in 1950. And when I first started, one of my degrees, I can't remember which one, was on uh, February 22nd, Washington's birthday. But it was so important to me as a young history uh, scholar that I realized I was now going through exactly the same process as was gone through by George Washington himself at one point when he was raised 
and eventually became a master mason uh, before our American Revolution. And that was important to me to know that, that I was walking the exact same steps and using approximately the same wording and getting the same kind of learning and teaching as the founding father of our country. Now, the actual stone masons, as were mentioned here, uh, these are the people who built all those cathedrals prior to 1700. And they weren't built at one time. If you go to uh, Westminster Abbey, they'll show you the oldest part, 1069. And then every century or so, things got added. Uh, the same thing is true uh, if you get to the uh, cathedrals in any part of the world. You'll find out when these things were done. But think of all the craftsmen who created that work and their ability. And that they had formed this kind of union, if you will, a kind of guild and a kind of fraternal organization, but all of them were operative, actual stone masons, people who could take stone, shape it properly, and put it in and make it work, and structurally and architecturally it was uh, proper. Now, what happened is, from 1700, we see the end of that period in history, and quite frankly, uh, there are no more great cathedrals being built. Men who were Freemasons, I'll tell you what they were. That meant that they were not tied by indenture or any other thing to some bishop or some cardinal or some prince or some king. They were free. They were free to offer their services to whoever was doing building. And you see, as the cathedrals start reducing in number, these people have got to get on the move to go chasing jobs in order to get uh, employment at the level that they want to be uh, paid. And those were the highest paid craftsmen of the time. They were the Freemasons. And as these lodges began to shrink, it was then that they finally decided with a decline in the number of craftsmen and young men were not coming in. And that's when they decided to take in and accept some men of goodwill and particularly men of status and stature, including the royalty, the people who were uh, in parliament, for example, in Britain and elsewhere uh, on the European continent. And that's why today you have the term free and accepted masons. Originally, the accepted masons were people like myself. I wouldn't know what to do with a stone and a chisel and a piece of stone if my life depended upon it. Uh, but I have been then an accepted mason as opposed to one who is genuinely an actual operative Freemason. Now, the free and accepted uh, now are the builders of a different kind of temple. And that's been made reference to. We're not talking about building physical buildings anymore. We're talking about this temple that I'm standing in right here now in front of you and the one that you're sitting in as you sit out there in front of me. And that's not a new metaphor, that notion that this is the image of God. And it is how we use it, how we share, how we give how we love one another. It is what is within us. And there are times when we get an opportunity. And when I think of all those children that the Shrine Hospitals help, that's, that's an act of God, in my opinion. When I think of what's happening now with dyslexic youngsters and what Scottish Rite is doing there, including right in this building with one uh, uh, learning center and another in Madison. And there are now uh, uh, rapidly being built all over the country. Uh, we're going to solve dyslexia. If the Masons take it on, it's going to get solved. Just as we are now beginning to run out of crippled and burned children. If you've got to have a problem, isn't that a marvelous problem to have? That we are no longer, and we have to import them from other countries because we've taken care of the problem here. What a marvelous thing for this fraternity to be able to do. And it used to do that without ever telling anyone. Well, on that basis, we became a social society and all the stonemasons' tools whether it has to do with living by the square or on a level. You all know what a level is? Well, you live on the level. All masons are on the level when they're in a lodge. Maybe not quite all. My brother Woods was in a Masonic club in the Philippines and after the island was fairly secure, they had a visit from uh, Brother Douglas MacArthur. Who, and he gave them all a speech with his five stars up here on the collar about how in this lodge there is no rank and there are no titles. We are all brothers on the level. But my brother said, nobody really went up and said, Doug, old boy, how are you? And put an arm <laughs> It is true that we do live by the square. And the square is a major tool of the stonemason. We live on the level, we hope. And we know that uh, on that trestle board is the work that's cut out for us for whatever years we've got left ahead of us. 
And in fact, when it comes to the issue of deity, as was mentioned here earlier, we don't use the term God or Allah or any of those, Jehovah. We use the term, again, a Masonic term from the craft, the supreme architect of the universe. Do you realize that's totally encompassing? So that there is no religious requirement in this fraternity except one. You cannot be an atheist. And the logic of that is that if you take an oath to whoever your God is, in whatever form you hold God and your beliefs, if you have no such belief that there's any power beyond you in the world, then your oath is no good. You can change it tomorrow. That was the basis of it. And it makes good logical sense to me. But as I look at what's happening now with Muslims and Christians and Jews at each other's throat and about to engage, I think, in a major uh, problem and battle coming up, if there was ever a time that that whole concept of tolerance and diversity, and this nation embodies that concept more than any other nation on the face of the earth. Now, where did this nation get it? I'll tell you flat out, there's no question in my mind, it came out of this fraternity, because you cannot separate the history of America from the history of Freemasonry in America. They are one and the same, and let me just uh, point that out to you. And by the way, it happens internationally. There have been six, in my opinion, six great true revolutions in the 17th and 18th century. What do I mean by a great and true revolution? A revolution that was not aimed at taking power. It was a revolution aimed at, at giving power to the people. And there were only six of those. One was obviously here in America. One was in France. One was in Italy. One was in Hungary. One was in South America, and one was in Mexico. Now, who were the leaders of those six great revolutions that brought power to the common people? Obviously, George Washington in this one, and in France it was Danton, in Italy it was Garibaldi, and in South America it was Simon Bolivar, Mexico, Juarez Benito Juarez, and in Hungary, Kashuth. All of those men, Freemasons, all of them, is that just chance? Is that just the luck of the dice? I don't think so. In fact, I'm wondering if all of our history can even be looked on as chance or luck. I look at, uh, we had a Scottish Rite dedication in this very hall. Now, I remember sitting back up there on, in the balcony and I was sitting with uh, Tom Amon, who was then our uh, county executive before he got pensioned off pretty well. And, <laughs> But sitting up here, where these men are sitting, was the head of the Prince Hall Lodge, the black Masonic lodges, was the head of the Grand Lodge here of Masons in Wisconsin. The Lord's Prayer was sung by the cantor from Temple Emmanuel, and the prayer opening invocation was done by the dean of the Roman Catholic Cathedral over here. And I looked at all of that, and I said to Tom, I said, do you realize what you're looking at could not have occurred even in this city just 20 years ago? That you see this gathering of people of different faiths, different religions, different races and ethnicities, and yet they're able to gather on a common basis. That's a historic event. You and I take those things for granted. I'll tell you the rest of the world doesn't, but they're starting to pay attention. When you had the great uh, head of our military, Powell, now Secretary of State, but when he was in command of the most powerful military force on the face of the earth as a general, and he turned over the baton of power to George Shalikashvili, the next chief of staff, you paid no attention to that at all. But do you think the rest of the world didn't notice that it was a black man passing the power peacefully to a man who had a Georgian-German-Polish accent named Shalikashvili? That can only happen here, but it's got to begin to happen elsewhere and throughout the world. In fact, the problems that we're seeing now, especially the so-called anti-Americanism, and much of it being fomented, but it's for good reason. America is no longer a place. In my opinion, America has become an idea, and the idea came from the craft of Freemasonry. And that idea is what's moving across the face of the globe, and if you're in power, those ideas are dangerous. And I can understand the Middle Eastern people. The ideas that are being presented in this country 
saying, look what happens when you let the common people move and control the government. They don't want any part of that because then they have to give up the levers of power. And this is going to take a struggle. There is no question about it. But it's starting to move worldwide and something that happened here. When I look at the key question for me, is this all chance or was it written on the trestle board? Did the supreme architect lay out the plans for the building, first of all, of this country to become the tool to bring freedom, tolerance, and love and peaceful connection to the rest of the world? History documents, uh, frankly, are, are limited in this fraternity because, as I said, it was all by oral tradition. We don't have many of the things that we wish we had in writing. The minute people are oral, then you lose out. And we're going back to that really in an indirect way through the internet that's all going to get lost. Although don't count on it if the IRS is uh, <laughs> investigating. No, uh, we've had that. Uh, Andrew Jackson, also a member of this fraternity and craft. But Andrew Jackson, uh, true to his Masonic tradition, was very oral. He didn't write things down. And we don't have a lot of things from the Jackson administration. No question for most historian and historical scholars that Jackson sent all those Tennesseans to Texas to get that revolution started. He wanted to get Texas into the Union, but he couldn't do that without getting into a war with Mexico, France, and with Austria. But by sending down the governor of Tennessee, a man named Sam Houston, and sending down the congressman from Tennessee, a man named Davy Crockett, and by sending down Jim Bowie and Travis and all those other names connected with the Alamo, and sent them down there to get that revolution started because he knew if Texas could free itself from the Mexican control, then it could be annexed and it could come into the United States and become a state, and that was his goal. No question about it. We pay a price for not having written documents. But there was also a great advantage. You see, no man is supposed to be quoted outside of a lodge. And in fact, that was very important in the American Revolution because the British who have always had kind of a separatist notion about themselves, carried their own Masonic lodges with every British regiment here in the colonies, and very seldom visited colonial lodges. But what that allowed is for those brothers to get in and argue the issue of whether we ought or ought not continue to support the king, or we ought to become our own free nation. Those discussions could be hammered out within a lodge knowing they weren't going to be quoted outside afterwards. We're fully aware that the Boston Tea Party followed a Masonic Lodge meeting. And the idea of getting dressed up in costumes to carry out something is not new to Freemasons. <laughs> the common thread of the 13 colonies, and you need to understand that they had very little in common. And especially when you've got these southern colonies with a slave base for their power and the northern colonies not only without a slave base but anti-slavery as they grew, particularly under Puritan, Congregational, and the Presbyterian drive up north. But the one thing they had in common was the craft. All of those leaders, and I do mean all, were Freemasons. And they could share that because you see, you don't know when you meet a Mason if he's a good man. I'll tell you that right now to our guests. You meet a Mason somewhere, a stranger, you don't know if he's a good man. But you do know that at one point in his life, a group of good men thought so. That you can be sure of. And that's what it means. And it's the one thing that is helpful, particularly if you get in strange areas and need help from a stranger. You'd be surprised the stories connected with that. But the revolution was, in fact, uh, absolutely fomented within the lodges, colonial lodges. Now, when I was out in Concord, and I see uh, brother, brother Paul Revere, who carried the message, as you well know, and the signal was from the sextant up in the Old North Church, and that had always bothered me as a historian. Why the Old North Church? I could understand the Old South. The Old South was a congregational church. And those were all the loud, big-mouthed, militant patriots. And there was no question they were not loyal to the crown. But Old North was an Anglican Episcopal church. 
before you had the establishment of an Episcopal separate church. They were Anglicans. They were loyal to the crown, loyal to the king and to the Bishop of Canterbury. Why would the signal come from Old North? It's because the sextant was a member of the craft. And they knew that the British troops would not be watching the Tower of Old North. You can bet they were watching Old South all the time for any kind of a signal. But nobody was watching the uh, Old North Tower as to whether the British were going to go by land or by sea. As you know, they chose land, and anybody who tries to move out of Boston by land is doomed. Uh, <laughs> The Declaration. The Declaration of Independence was not signed July 4th. I think most of you know that. Those men had to get out of there and get home safely, or they were going to be captured and tried. That was, they all added their names much later. One name was signed on it, a brother named John Hancock. But that was because he was already under warrant. He already had a price on his head. And he knew when he came there that if he got caught and the British didn't want to make a move on him uh, while the session was involved with the declaration because there were too many other people there to help him and support him. But the rest of them took off and then the document was sent around until they all uh, signed on. But quite frankly, it was Brother Hancock whose name went on there first and began that declaration. Now, who carried out the war? I, George Washington, obviously, member of the fraternity. His aide, Brother Alexander Hamilton. His key generals, von Steuben, Wayne, Allen, Lafayette, even Kazimir Pulaski, the young uh, Polish count, and yes, Brother Benedict Arnold, I must admit. As I said, a group of men thought so, but at some point he turned. I just want you to know that Washington needed that thread because he knew that if he had his top generals and they were all fellow brother Masons, he could trust them, and he knew he had a tie to them, a cable tow to them, that was different from just commanding officer to the uh, next uh, level of rank. And the Constitutional Convention, after that successful war, when the Constitutional Convention was carried out, it almost failed. We almost didn't get that Constitution. And what saved it, and there's a dozen accounts that any of you can check that out, an 81-year-old Grand Master of the Lodge of Pennsylvania stood up and talked to them, and I'm talking about the great Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin saved that Constitutional Convention, and they finally all agreed that they would sign and worry about the, what we call the Bill of Rights at the first act of the next Congress, and they pledged those that were going to become congressmen that that would be the act one of Congressman one, and it was, and they passed those first 10 amendments. Is that just chance? I don't think so. That that 81-year-old who really did not want to be at that convention, he was really not very well, and he'd been spending a lot of time over in Europe. I look at Lincoln. I'm telling you, Abraham Lincoln as a two-year, one-term congressman, holding no other political office, a lawyer from the backwoods of Illinois out west, as it was called at the time, and frankly representing a brand new party created farther north up in Ripon, Wisconsin, just six years before. He didn't stand a snowball's chance in Hades of being elected the president of the United States. He was going up against a giant from Illinois itself, Stephen Douglas. He was going up against the vice president of the United States, uh, Mr. Breckinridge, and a man by the name of Bell. All three of them were powerhouses. And yet when the smoke cleared, out comes Lincoln holding the brass ring. Now why? First of all, he was the only one who understood that the key important issue of that era was to preserve this experiment, to preserve this union. If any one of the other three had been elected, there would not have been a civil war, as they call it. And frankly, we would have divided into two countries. And frankly, Europe would have been back here in force. But when I think of the moon landing, and I look at uh, Armstrong and, uh, and Aldrin, those two men, both of them uh, fellow Masons, I had a chance to sit with uh, Neil Armstrong at the EAA. 
and asked him, I said, those words are just incredible. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I said, did Chris Kraft, who was PR for NASA at the time, I said, did Chris Kraft uh, put that together? It sounds like his work, because I think he's terrific. And Armstrong said, no, he didn't. And I don't know where it came from. That isn't what I was preparing to say. Chris Kraft had given me something to say. And it was very beautiful. But for whatever reason, I just blurted that out. I looked at our uh, atom bomb itself and the decision to use it. And that was a member of the Kraft brother, Harry Truman, 33rd degree. But I, I look at the fact that this country created that. When you say to yourself, how come we got that bomb? And think of if anybody else had gotten it, would they have done with it what we did? Especially Germany, Japan, Italy, or the uh, Soviet Union. Just think if they'd gotten that. Well, you say, well, those American scientists did that. Very important that we had all those brains over here. Uh-uh. Robert Oppenheimer was the only one born here. Einstein, who sold it, fled Germany and came here. Uh, Teller and Zillard out of Hungary. And uh, Enrico Fermi out of Italy. They come here to the uh, to University of Chicago. Why Chicago? Because Chicago had been a member of the Big Ten, and they quit football in 1937 and 38. Oh, what's that got to do with anything? I'll tell you what it's got to do. It's got to do with the fact that when they got in here, they find that here's a university that has a big, hollow, cement horseshoe and nothing to do with it. They don't need it. And they built the world's first nuclear accelerator inside that Alonzo Stagg Stadium, smashed the atom from there to Los Alamos, and you know the rest of that story. And I tell you what happened in 1945. The two bombs that we dropped... They were not the most important. I'm telling you, it's the third one that we never dropped until the following spring in Bikini. Never before in the history of the world did any nation ever have a sword that powerful and didn't use it to subject its neighbor to its will. And instead, this whole nation said to its government, you bring those boys home, you turn that bomb into a plowshare, and they did. And I submit to you, no other nation on earth would have done that. I look at World War II, and for those of you uh, as our guests tonight, who are the names you associate with bringing about the successful conclusion of that war? You've got to start with Churchill and Roosevelt, no question about those two, and followed by Harry Truman, and certainly General Marshall, and the Truman or Marshall plan that followed after the war that preserved that peace. And you've got to look at Douglas MacArthur out in the Pacific and what he did in laying a constitution and creating a democracy in Japan from a nation that had been a warrior nation now, am I to tell you that most of those men are Masons? No. All of those men were Freemasons. Admiral King, I can go to start going down the line. Admiral Leahy, I can go down to uh, Bull Halsey. But there's no sense in going down farther ranks in either theater. The five key men, all of them members of this craft. Is that just chance? Or did they carry with them those notions that they learned from the time that they entered as a entered apprentice? But I think this current century, the one that I'm going to miss, is very promising because there's a possibility of a quantum leap to build the world's royal arch that will cover all of the peoples, all of the religions, all of the races uh, of this world to understand that we are all brothers and sisters and that we are under one fatherhood. It is possible a world of no war, of religious tolerance, of racial tolerance, with food, shelter, and security for everybody in the world, and a brotherhood of mankind. So for those of you now who are my brothers in this hall, I tell you, this is no time for any of you, regardless of your age, to say it is high 12 and there is no work before us. He has put a good deal of work on that trestle board and let us get to our labors and finish building the temple. There's an incredible opportunity. Thank you for letting me talk to all of you.